Hi guys, I'm Darren and in this video, yep, it's that time of year again. There's a new version of iNav, so we're gonna check out what's new for fixed wing pilots in this version. So if you haven't seen it already, Lee at Painless 360 has put up a new video about iNav 5.0 and some of the features in it. I'm in the video and Lee and I sort of discuss some of our favorite new features. No doubt it's gonna be a bit shorter than this video, so make sure you check that one out too on Lee's channel. And what we're gonna do is go through the list. So like normal, I've written more bullet points than an article on the INAF fixed wing group site, just highlighting the main things that have been added to 5.0 that affect us as fixed wing pilots. I've not added targets this time round because to be honest, most of the time we know when a new target is out for a flight controller. If not, it's easy enough to find out. So I've really just concentrated on the features. So what we're gonna do is go down through the list and check some of them out. Okay, so the article is on the INAV Fixed Wing Group site. I've put a link in the video description so you can go check that out if you want. And this is the article right here. So at the top, there are two links. They will take you to all the pull requests for INAV 5.0 for the firmware and the configurator. And that's including everything. Uh, so it would have targets, bug fixes, whether it's for fixed wing, multi-rotor or whatever, it's all in there. On this, I'm really sort of focusing more on sort of the fixed wing side, uh, but also not really so much on bug fixes. It's really more about the features. So let's go into the first section and just check out some of these. First section is radio telemetry and protocols. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the latest thing that was actually put in probably in the last week is that refresh rates have been removed from ESCs unless they're brushless. For any brushed ESCs, the refresh rate is now automatic. You don't need to worry about it. You, you just select the ESC you want to use. Again, while we're on the page, if you wanted to delve deeper into them, these numbers here will take you to that particular pull request. So the higher numbers will be the firmware side, um, the lower numbers around 1,500 and below will be the configurator side. So there's been a fix for smart audio. If you've got a TBS 69, you may have found that your smart audio wouldn't work with it. It was actually discovered that it uses a different stop bit to regular smart audio. So you now have the option to change that between one and two stop bits. Anything on like smart audio 2.1 or above, that doesn't work, maybe just try putting it on stop bit number one. There is also a new document. So I'm in the iNav GitHub. If I go into docs, there is a vtx.md document. This will show you how you set up or different options for setting up your VTXs. So at the top, we've got the Matek 1.3 gigahertz second edition VTX, which now has tramp telemetry added. Anything else that has special notes with tramp telemetry can go in this section here, just to show you how to set it up, that sort of thing. And then below we have TBS Smart Audio. There's a couple of things that's been in it for quite a while. So there is the AKK workaround, which by default is set to on, I believe. So, but that's been in for quite a long time. If you have problems with Smart Audio, try turning that off. If you're using Soft Serial and you're having trouble with Smart Audio, you could try turning the VTX Smart Audio alternate ser Soft Serial method to off. Sorry, to on, yeah, to off, it's on by default. And this is the new one here. If you're using a, a TBS69 set, VTX Smart Audio stop bits to one. So next up, we have ESC protocols fall back to multi-shot if D-shot is unavailable. So again, this is an automatic thing. If you set it up for D-shot and it doesn't work, it will go and use multi-shot. And finally, there's the IRC tramp support for the Matek 1G3 SE VTX, which we just mentioned earlier. Again, it, how to set it up is in this vtx.md document. So you just read this, set it up and you're good to go. Right, the next section is the OSD. Again, I'm gonna be talking quite quick, going through this quick, cause it's quite a long list and I, I'm quite aware that these videos usually end up quite long. As I say, if you're interested in it, you can click on the number. So let's click on this one just to see what you will see. So this pull request, uh, which is for ESP32 radar, radar now supports the correct units for all OSD types. So before the numbers on INAV radar, which has been renamed ESP32 radar, were always metric unless you used the Imperial 
OSD units. There are other OSD units that don't use metrics such as General Aviation and UK. So there's support now added for UK and General Aviation unit types. You will see the same values for distance and altitude as you would on the rest of your OSD. So there's no confusion now. Don't worry about this because it's actually been superseded, uh, which I should really reorder these. Actually, that, <laughs> that one came after this one. I need to update this document quick. So yeah, I'm actually missing one that should be above this, which again is related to ESP32 radar. So if you've been using it with iNav 4.0, you would have noticed that occasionally you would get a flash with a number with an, either an up or down arrow on it. Now that is the altitude difference and it is limited to 99 either feet or meters depending on the units you're using. But it was literally a one second flash up then you had to wait I believe it was five seconds for the distance and then again it just flashed up for one second so you blink and you miss it. The change that I need to put on here will actually allow you to choose how long you see each of those things. If you don't want to see the altitude at all just set it to zero. But if you wanted to see the altitude for maybe three seconds and then the distance for three seconds, which I believe are the, the default values, then you can change them to however long you want, up to 10 seconds. So there's a lot of choice there. I'll make sure that I add this in the document before you guys see it so that you can actually check that out if you want to. So the ESP32 radar up and down arrows fixed. Basically there was a font change in INAV 3.0. The ESP32 radar guys were told about it, but they didn't actually get a fix in for the up and down arrows. That has now been fixed in INAV 5. CMS and statistics layout pages adjusted for HD canvas mode systems. Well, the CM CMS is the OSD menu. So that and the stats page have been updated so they fit better on the HD systems. Milliamp powers can now cope with batteries larger than 999 milliamps. Now, if you're one of these guys who does either massive flight times or some, got, some of you guys do massive long range flights and you have, you know, 15 amp hour batteries or whatever, you would have noticed that when you got to 999 milliamp hours, it would have gone to a thousand or it would have looked like it gone to a thousand. Basically, it just showed you the first four numbers and the last one was cut off. What this change does actually gives you a couple of options. You can leave it as default and that will still show you the four digits. So you'd once you got up to 999, you'd actually then see 10 point and then the, um, the next two numbers. So you're actually seeing 10.11 amp hours, for example, but it actually changes the symbol to amp hours. So you know that you are you know, further on into the battery or you can actually change the number of um, units that you see to five or six. Now, I don't think anyone in the next 100 years is gonna get into the end of the six digits because that's a ridiculous amount of battery storage on your plane. But it means that you, if you set it to five, once you get to 999, it will roll on to 10,000. So you, your milliamp hours will be correct. And of course, those systems, if they do exceed, will go to a decimalized amp hour version. So, you know, <laughs> the six figures never going to be never going to be beaten. Challenge me, challenge me, <laughs> build a plane with uh, a massive, massive battery. So next up, we have Crossfire Power Stat updated. Now, what this is, the uh, value you saw on the OSD wasn't actually the value sent back by the protocol. So this has now been changed to use the correct value. It's also added in a milliwatt setting for Crossfire version 3 support. So there's some future planning going in with this as well. Switch position indicators added to the OSD. And what it actually will do is put a physical indicator of a switch on screen. So if you've got a three-way switch, it actually goes through the three positions. If you've got a two-way switch, it just goes through the two positions, but it also has four characters next to it. So you can set it to whatever you want. For example, landing gear, you can just write gear, and then you have the switch up and down position to know if your landing gear is up or down. You can actually change the name of the labels. You assign the radio channel that is actually doing the switching. So it's, it's all quite customizable. You can even decide whether the label is on the left or the right, but that is standard for all four switches. You can now change the length of time that system messages are displayed. Again, I don't really need to go into that. The CLI command will be in this pull request. So moving on to the general tab, 
uBlock's 10 GPS modules are now supported and this also adds better detection for previous uBlocks version. It actually came about that the original way of doing it was working pretty much by pure luck, but now it is actually getting the uBlocks versions correctly. So going forward, we'll have no problems with that whatsoever. Outputs can now be assigned as per the target specifications, or they could all be motors or servos. So what this means is it's, it's giving people more options. Where we don't have resource remapping in iNav, it can now allow you to set all the outputs to motors. So if you've maybe got, uh, I think Pavel mentioned a power lifting quad or whatever, what's got eight motors on it, you can set all your outputs to motors. If you're building a nitro plane, you can set all of them to servos and use the throttle on a servo. So there's a lot more options there. Okay, so this next one fixes an issue with the RTH sanity check if you suddenly switch to use a safe home. So when you engage return to home, there is a sanity check that checks that you are sort of flying back to home and doesn't let you fly too far away. What this will now do is if you're using a safe home is make sure that the sanity check is based on the safe home, not your home position. Basically the default settings, if you start flying away, like you're gaining altitude, if you've got climb first on, for example, if you fly away more than 500 meters, which yes, yeah, half a kilometer is quite a distance. And if you don't start coming back, it will deem that you're actually on a flyaway. So it will activate the emergency landing feature. What this does is make sure that it uses the safe home that you're about to fly to for that sanity check. Right, the next one is a, a very important one, which to be honest, I don't think I really need to go into much detail because it's been covered by quite a few people, including in Lee's video in the INF Fixwing group. Everyone knows about the configuration change bug. If you got to the flying field, put your goggles on to fly and you saw gyro hardware LPF out of range, that's the bug. And it actually changed three settings. We've got an article about the whole thing on the INF Fixwing group website and the settings that you needed to put back. Basically, this fixes it. There was a problem with the MSP version checking and basically it would think that it was on one version of MSP when it wasn't and it would write false data to those three parameters. This is now completely gone in 5.0. It's so you'll never see that that issue prop up again, which yeah, if, if none of the extra features tick, <laughs> tick your box, that is probably the best reason to upgrade to 5.0. Just to be clear, this is not related to the occasional bug where you'll lose your whole configuration on the flight controller. At the moment, it's still believed that's related to power spikes, power being removed too early while the configuration is still being written, or even you know, loose USB cables in the vertical USB ports are the ones that are most susceptible to this from what we've seen so if there's a bit of movement it can cause you know a little bit of data interruption maybe a bit of a power spike and that is enough to maybe lose your configuration so it's still a very good idea once you've got everything set up to make a backup so a diff all and also once you're happy with the tune make another one so you've got got all that information with you just as a note if you're using things like speedy b um, that will also be affected. So where this issue was mostly happening, once you, if you do a configuration update, it wasn't just on iNav Configurator. If you've done an update with SpeedyB, that could cause that issue too. SpeedyB are working to get their apps up to date, so there should be a new version out soon which supports 5.0, and then you shouldn't have to worry about this problem again. So there was a, a bug that affected very, very few people, um, which has now been fixed. So this mostly affected multi-rotors, but it involved making adjustments to the RC inputs in flight. It's not really something that we did with fixed wing, even it's not the whole in-flight adjustment feature, it was if you make adjustments to the inputs, but that is now fixed. Right, if you have an emergency landing because a sensor has failed, it will now cancel the emergency landing if the sensor starts working again. So that's a good thing. It will get you back in the air. And so for example, you were returning to home, GPS temporarily failed, it went into emergency landing, GPS comes back online, it will carry on returning to home. So 
yeah, nice, nice fix. Modes for multi rotors are now sh not showing up on fixed wing. Now this may seem as a funny thing to list in the firmware side of the changes, but actually it's the firmware that decides what you see in the modes page on the configurator. It's not actually something in the configurator itself. So that means on the fixed wing modes page, you won't see things like head free anymore. They're all gone. They're just for the multi rotor guys. All right, so this is an interesting one. The uh, there are improvements for the auto launch abort procedures. So before, if you wanted to abort the um, the launch, you had to make sure your throttle was down and then abort it. What this change does is allow you to abort the uh, launch. So that means wiggling the, the, the sticks basically. So long as your throttle is between off and the idle throttle. If it's above that, it won't abort still. Also something that I didn't realize, uh, if you use an auto launch on a switch, you had to abort it with the switch. This will actually now abort it with wiggling the sticks too. So some nice, nice improvements there. And the final one in the general category is you can now change the color of your LED strips using an RC channel. I've sort of had a brief look into this, but it seemed a bit, <laughs> it didn't seem very uh, intuitive how you set it up. There are some notes in here uh, but it looks like you have to really set it up in CLI. There are There is something in Configurator so you can select it, but only after you've added it in CLI. So maybe this could be improved in the future. I, I need to play about with it to see what it actually does with the color. There's, there's really not a lot of documentation, but it's something you can do. Originally, I thought it'd be really cool because you could set maybe low throttle to sort of off and then maybe have mid throttle to orange and so high throttle to like a ready orange and set it up like an afterburner or something like that uh like a, well, a fake afterburner but it doesn't seem to look like that way it looks like you just select a color and then it just changes the hue of it or something i don't really know but anyway that's an option it's in there so if you're interested check it out and have a go so now we're into the more advanced features tuning and programming so this is going to be for like in-flight tuning and the programming tab in iNav so let's have a look so fixed wing level trim can now be adjusted in flight with in-flight adjustments which you could do board pitch and board roll before but this now allows you to set the the level trim so it doesn't really need much more explanation or of course auto level will get you in a pretty good place and then you can just use this to, to fine tune it. So for example, if you're in a cruise, you raise the throttle, you find that it is actually starting to climb or something like that. You can just bump it down a little bit it, with the in-flight adjustment. Of course, cruise has altitude hold on it, but if you're in uh, course hold or crash mode, then this will, this will help. Ah, <laughs> the one that I thought I missed, I've actually got here. So maybe I should put that in the OSD section. So pilots can set the time that you can view altitude and distance difference with ESP32 radar. I explained that earlier. I will actually move that to that same section. It makes more sense. Right, allow tuning of the TPA time constant in flight. Now, this is something I didn't even know existed. As a big thanks to Jetrail for pointing this one out. It's a really good thing for tuning your TPA. So um, a default has also been added, which will give pretty decent results for most people, but this allows you to fine tune it in the in-flight adjustments as well. The total number of logic conditions you can have in programming has increased from 32 to 64. Thanks to the MSP fix, also at the same time, logic conditions were changed so that they could basically fetch one at a time, which means that now the number of logic conditions that we can sort of use is just a basically a number and how much space we have on the flight controller but to be honest 64 should be plenty it does mean that your diffs will take a little bit longer to to copy in because you've got all those logic conditions but you know there's a little price to pay with it with with stuff like this but it gives you plenty of opportunities for programming stuff in iNav now you can now set target rates or angles for each axis in the programming tab. So perhaps a, a small example of this is maybe if you've set up a geofence and you do it on return to home, you could have it. So when you leave return to home, it just does a little wing wobble or something like that to let you know that the return to home has ended. You could also maybe use it for a climb mode if you put it in sort of course hold 
you could then use a, a slider to set the value that you increase the angle on the axis for. I mean, there's easier ways of doing that particular one, but it's, it's just examples of what you could do. The number of battery cells is now available to you in logic conditions. So if you wanted to set up specific logic based on the number of cells you're using, you can do that now. And also a couple of comparators have been added for min and max. So you can basically say, give a cap or a, a floor to certain values. So for example, if you're reading in a, a, a slider, but you only wanted it to go up to 1,500, you could set 1,500 as a cap. And no matter how high above that you go, Actually, there was someone I was helping out with something that this would be really useful for. They wanted to put um, an automatic tilt on their camera, on their quad. And basically using this, you could set a maximum and minimum angle um, to, to make sure that the, the camera on the servo doesn't go too far. So th yeah, there's more, more stuff to do in programming. So now automated flight and waypoint missions. So now you can force that the waypoint altitude is reached before the craft will continue on to the next waypoint. Now that's going to be pretty useful. For example, if you're flying reasonably low, get to your waypoint, but between this waypoint and the next, there's quite a big hill or something like that. So now you can actually force it to get up to altitude before it continues on to the next waypoint, just in case you know, there's not enough angle there to climb up. On a quad, obviously that's really easy. It just goes straight up, but on a fixed wing, it will loiter up to the altitude. So the next one on our list is that landing detection has been added to fixed wing, which is something that unsurprisingly wasn't there before. The more exciting thing is that it also now means that there is a notion of the fixed wing is flying, which means we can do some cool things knowing that it's flying. Now, this might not always work. If you get stuck in a tree, it may be enough movement to still keep the flying active, but regular landings will be absolutely fine and unscheduled landings will be fine also. So the way it works is it detects vertical and horizontal speed. So if your vertical speed is less than 1.8 kilometers an hour approximately, and if your horizontal speed is less than 3.6 kilometers per hour, again, approximately, it's all in centimeters per second, then it will detect axis rates to make sure that they are low or non-existent. Then finally, it will check absolute movement in pitch and roll. So if, as I said, if you are in a tree and getting blown about by wind, it may not realize it's armed, so best to disarm it but if you land on the ground it should automatically disarm so if you want to use it there is a cli command to activate it which is nav underscore disarm underscore on underscore landing equals on and that will activate this feature you will actually get information in the osd when this happens you should get a system message saying landing detected and you should also see disarmed by landing on the stat screen right so that's the main updates in the firmware now we're going to take a look at the configurator, which has had quite a bit of work done to it. OK, so the first one, fixed OSD elements reappearing when they are supposed to be hidden. So this is related to if you're using DJI. So I can actually show this. So if you're using DJI, you've got this little box down here and you can choose to hide unsupported elements. Now, these here are the elements that are now supported by DJI. But if you change to a different layout, you'd get everything back again. To be honest, someone picked this up in the release candidates, but I'm guessing that this happened in older versions too. But now you can flip between layouts and it will be as it's supposed to be. Uh, right, next one, you can no longer adjust the ESC pulse width modulation rate. We mentioned that in the firmware, this is the sort of the configurator side of it. The next one is help icons now take you to the settings document. So if we pop back into configurator, we're on our configuration page and you can see here one for the I squared C uh, speed. If we click on that, it takes us to GitHub and the I squared C command from the CLI. So you can see the default value, any minimum and maximum that are set um, and information on how you can change it. Next up, adjustments have been reordered. Now this is really just a tidying up type thing. So if I enable that, you can see that we now have category headings and we have our adjustments 
all grouped together. So if you wanted to adjust PID stuff, they're all in the PID section, navigation stuff and miscellaneous. So it's just to try and make things a bit neater so it's easier to use. Next up, 3D motor configuration move to the outputs page. Now I will do a section at the end of a video so that I can do a chapter for people who don't watch the whole thing because there are a couple of things that have moved. Sliders added to some settings. Now this is mostly in PID tuning and Pavel has added some sliders so that you can just slide things backwards and forwards to adjust the pits. Next one, auto launch idle throttle has been added to advanced tuning. So if you've used idle throttle on your fixed wing, a really great feature has been that you can actually have a delay before the idle kicks in. So on a lot of things, I set it up for five seconds. So basically you set your idle throttle, but it takes five seconds, then the idle will kick in and then you can throw the plane. It just gives you a little bit of time to get yourself settled in. Maybe you have your transmitter on the floor. So yeah, it's, it's a really nice feature, but before it was only in the CLI. Now you can just set it here. So if I want a five second delay, I can do that. This is again using the units. So we are on metric, so that's why it's in seconds. Usually it would be in milliseconds. Sorry, I'm just highlighting the first letter of each <laughs> so I know where I am. Right, the font selection box has been moved. Basically, if we go back in the OSD, when we click font manager, before it would cover everything up, it's still gonna cover up quite a bit because this is quite a low screen, but, um, You've got a lot more there, so you can actually preview what the font looks like when you click to change it. So that was just lowered down slightly for you. Right, the craft name. This is another move, so I'll mention that at the end. Right, update available messages will now long, no longer appear if you choose the option. So up in this gear up here, we have this tick box for receive desktop notifications when application updates are available. If that's ticked, you get updates when there's a new version out, but now if you uncheck it, then you don't. So for example, if you've got older versions of iNav Configurator because you've got multiple versions on different models, then every time you load an old version, you don't really wanna see a warning box to say that there's a new version. Judging by how people have been downloading the release candidates, everyone knows when there's a new version out anyway, but you know, it's up to you whether you have that on or off, but now the option actually works. Before you could disable it and it would still give you alerts. So that's fixed. Right, BLE, TCP and UDP connection methods added. So if I disconnect here, we can see we have Bluetooth low energy and then these two, which are uh, IP protocols. So you can connect via wireless methods, either Wi-Fi using one of these two or Bluetooth low energy. I've not played with this. I don't have Bluetooth on or Wi-Fi on any of my flight controllers, so I've not really played with it, but uh, Samsung from Matek has actually done a demo showing uh, the F405 WTE connecting via Wi-Fi, and also other guys have done a Bluetooth low energy sort of demo. So it's, it's a nice wireless way of connecting. Also means if you've got a dodgy USB cable, then perhaps you'll not have the issue of a configuration wipe so yeah there's there's benefits there but it also means if you use speedy b adapters then now you can just wirelessly connect when you're at home as well buttons added to the cli page right so as part of the fix for the no longer random configuration change where you'd get the gyro hardware lpf out of range and all that stuff in the cli now we've got a couple of buttons added so there's a save settings button which is basically the same as writing save and uh, there's an MSC button, which will allow you to access your SD card through Windows. And there's an exit button. If you want to come out of the CLI, press exit, and it will actually shut down the CLI properly. Right, mixers are now automatically applied with default. So to highlight that, what I can do is go into PID tuning. I can click select new defaults. And basically what this means is when you freshly flash your flight controller, if you choose one of these defaults, so let me choose, what did we have? We had flying wings. So let's choose aeroplane with a tail. And what that will do is apply the base mixer for aeroplane with a tail, which is a standard sort of, yeah, there we go. Standard aeroplane. Of course you can still go into mixer and change it to whatever you want. If you've got V tail, whatever. 
if you're using an Elevon mix, you won't have to change anything. If you're using an aeroplane, chances are you probably won't have to change anything either. So it just speeds things up slightly. Select which fields are recorded in black box. Now, I don't know if this is going to show anything. Oh, yeah. So you can actually choose which ones you want to record and which ones you don't. So, for example, if you just record, want to record the gyro data for gyro flow, you can turn everything else off and then you'll get a longer log file with that gyro data. Right, multiple copies of high DJI unused um, has been fixed. So if we pop back into the OSD, what would happen in the older versions is when you, I can't remember the, what caused it, but this this would just basically repeat itself over and over and over again. It doesn't do it anymore, it's fixed. Copy target names now work in the firmware flash search box. So if we go into CLI and I do version, this will give us the target name. It's also at the top of our diff. So with this target name, it wouldn't have actually caused a problem anyway. So it's hard to really demonstrate it. But if you had a target name with underscores in it, then it typically wouldn't work. But what it will do is if we disconnect, we go to the firmware flasher. If we put copy that or paste that in, it will now find that one. But if I get rid of some of those bits, where we had like this Matek F405 Servo 6 on the version in iNav that actually has an underscore in the middle. If you had put that in before, it wouldn't have found that, but it will now. And actually there's something I've put in this morning, which will pretty much make this redundant anyway. So version six has already got cool stuff coming. Almost empty battery is now fixed in the vision font. The wrong font icon was being shown, but that's fixed now. Parameters that are different based on control or battery profiles can be highlighted. Okay, so let me just connect up and right up the top here, you can sort of already see what I mean. The profile is sort of a light blue color and the battery is a light orange color. So if we pop into advanced tuning here, you can see that uh, idle throttle, launch throttle, cruise throttle, pitch to throttle ratio, min and max throttle have all got a light orange background to the inputs. That means that they are different per battery profile. So if I was to change the battery profile to, for example, and then change that to 1500, do a quick save and reboot. So it's now 1500 in profile two. If we go back to profile one, you'll see that it's still 1400. And the light blue background means that it is a profile. If you didn't want those, you can turn off highlight parameters here. Now they're just back to normal. And if you want to turn it back on again, there you go turn it on there right gps configuration moved again i'll cover that in about three items time right mixer enhancements now this is quite a biggie so if we pop into the mixer at the moment everything looks normal but i can guarantee you that it isn't so the way we used to work is you have our motor table and our servo table down here and each one has a number so you have motor number one there and our servos were labeled well at least from 4.0 onwards from one down to for example four on this plane so those uh, servo and motor numbers relate to this output mapping table here so motor one motor one outputs on channel s1 which you can see up here on our image so then the servos Servo 1 will be S3, Servo 2, S4, Servo 3, S5, Servo 4, S6. And obviously if you add more or less servos, they would change up here. And then these output numbers again would relate to where they are on your flight controller. Now the problem before was this image here was just an image. Right, so I've just switched to a two motor configuration just to highlight the change. So on some flight controllers, mainly like F405 standard, maybe F722 standard, but standard flight controllers. You would actually have motor one on S1, but motor two would be on something like S7. So the image would be wrong because it would always say sort of S1, S2. Right now, this is no longer a static image. If I click on aeroplane, 
you can see we don't have any numbers on here at all. If I load the mixer, they get populated and they're actually text fields and it actually gets populated by these values here. So if I change servos around, which I'll show you in a minute, these numbers on here are the correct numbers and we can quickly verify that when we scroll down. But while we're up here, notice the colors we have. Our left aileron is red, our right aileron is green, our rudder is blue and our elevator is orange. So now when I scroll down, you'll see how it all ties in. So our stabilized pitch is orange, which ties into the elevator. Our sta first stabilized roll is red, which ties into our left aileron. Second stabilized roll is green, which ties into the right aileron. And our stabilized yaw is blue, which ties into the rudder. What, for example, would happen if I change that to servo three and that to servo one? Actually, what you'd expect. So the numbers of the servos have changed. So our stabilized roll, uh, our first stabilized roll is now this one here, which is red. So we're looking at servo one. Servo one is on S3, which is on S3. Our second servo is on S2, which is green as our stabilized roll. S servo two, S4, S4 green, that's all good. Our pitch on servo three is servo three, which is S5, which also shows S5 there. And our euro is exactly the same, still it's on S6. So you can see when we change stuff down here, it changes stuff up here too. So what about if I delete the yaw? You'll see that it completely goes from the image. So um, this updates exactly to what you've got set out. All right, so if I add another motor mixer before, I don't know if it's gonna show it, but if you set up differential thrust, you would end up with something like 0 0.299999 or 2.77 that's fixed. <laughs> you, we just get s solid values now in our stabilized yaw. And I'm trying to think what else has changed. Not really fixed wing, but some of you guys fly these things as well. The motor reversed now shows the correct direction on the diagram. So this doesn't actually reverse the motors, but at least you can see which way the prop's spinning. One more cool thing, because we haven't actually loaded and applied this yet, we can refresh which will put us back to our aeroplane that we actually loaded the mixer for. So there we go. That's, a, I think, about it for the mixer. But yeah, hopefully this will be a lot easier for you guys to use. Uh, right, units, conversions, enhanced, fixed, and extended. So back on the advanced tuning page, because I like pages that take ages to load, you'll notice that we have our units down here. So at the moment I'm on metric. If I turn that back to none, we will see the flight controller default unit. So we have microseconds, milliseconds, degrees, centimeters per second, etc. So one of the things that we had on iNav, uh, I believe this first came in iNav 3 and then was updated a little bit in iNav 4, but we also had our units on the end here, which was really confusing. If we're using it with none, they would both match up. But if we switched over to something else, like let's switch to metrics, seeing as I'll get moaned at by Hoffman if I don't, you would have, for example, kilometers per hour, you would have centimeters per second. So that, that confusion has now gone. There's also been more added. So for example, times are now changed between milliseconds and seconds, but for small values such as this, it's kept as milliseconds. There should be somewhere there is temperature, which now actually does convert between centigrade and Fahrenheit. So it has just been improved uh, quite a lot. Next version, if you hover over the label, it will actually tell you what they are. I just didn't get that in quick enough for i 5 but yeah, that's coming. So that's the uh, units enhancement. It, it works the same as before. So you can choose metric, imperial or OSD and it will show you the correct units. And the final one, the operations in logic conditions are now uh, 
again reordered to look neater. So it will go into programming and oh, I don't need to enable it. But you can see it's the same sort of setup as we had in the um, adjustment. So there are now sections um, and then all the actual operations are grouped together. So it should make these easier to find and easier to use. So that's the end of our list, apart from the three that I skipped. So this section is for those of you who couldn't be bothered to watch the rest of the video, but this will make you watch it at the end anyway. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there are some things that have moved and one of my pet hates is when things are moved But no one actually tells you about it. So on this configuration page There were a few things that are no longer here. So we had somewhere around here a 3d motors box This was over on this side and around here we had craft name and also around here somewhere We had a GPS section they're all no longer on the configuration page. So where is everything? If, if we pop into outputs, if you want to use reversible motors, you can now just toggle this and your values that were on the configuration page are then shown to you. If we pop into GPS, this is where we set our GPS up. So of course that would be my setup. So yeah, GPS setup on the GPS page where it should have been all along. But Pavel moved it finally. Um, some things you, are so simple you just don't think of them. But yeah, this makes perfect sense. So thank you, Pavel. Um, and finally, if we pop into the OSD, this is where the craft name now sits. And there's a reason for this is if I put it on screen. Before, we just had our big craft name box and if people wanted stuff centered, they would have to use spaces and all that sort of nonsense. But also if you had a short craft name and I put this here, we'd get a red box because the craft name's too long. Now we just type in what we want. The box is now the correct size. We can put it where we want. It's just much better for ordering. Also, you can't use characters that aren't allowed, so you won't get any dodgy fonts showing up. It's just much nicer and much better all round. So those are the three changes for things that have moved in Configurator. And that is the end of the video. So I hope you guys have found this interesting. I, if you have, please give it a thumbs up and please click the subscribe and the bell icon to help get this video up to more people so they can learn about some of these changes too. I hope actually that you guys just get out and enjoy iNav 5. It, I've been flying it pretty much since iNav 4 came out in various uh, stages and it, it flies absolutely fine. And some of these features, I, I just absolutely love some of these features. They're brilliant. So thank you very much for watching guys. Fly your models like you stole them. See you on the next one.